Could we actually do a digital twin of the Jenga stack? Yeah, but I'm much better in my simulations <laughs> than I'm in the real world. My name is Gavin Laybourne. I'm a Chief Information Officer for APM Terminals, which is part of AP Muller Maersk. Um, I'm actually an electrical engineer as a background, and now I've moved into the world of logistics. Hello, my name is Wil van der Aalst. I'm a professor at RWTH Aachen University. I'm also known as the, the godfather of process mining. On a personal level, um, I used to develop computer games when I was 14 years old and set up a company. Perhaps a personal thing, I'm also the father of four children that I'm very proud of. Thanks, Gavin. <coughs> Let the games begin. We're the best man. <laughs> I always like to distinguish between a, a digital twin and a, and a digital shadow. And so in my definition, a digital shadow is like a digital model that you base on reality, and a digital twin is something that tries to influence reality. How advanced are digital twins now? If people ask me about how can you see the development of digital twins, I always like to compare it to, to self-driving cars, eh, where uh, the idea of a self-driving car dates from uh, 1930, eh, where people were already experimenting with it, and today we are still talking about it. And uh, what is now the state of the art is the Mercedes S-Klasse, that is the first that is uh, operating at level 3. So level 3 is the first level where uh, a car is actually driving itself. And this has an international uh, license, uh, you can, so you can drive it everywhere. Uh, but the small print is that you can only uh, drive it below 60 km per hour on the highway during daytime. Yeah, so, so you can see that uh, autonomous driving is, uh, is improving every year, uh, but these are gradual developments. And I think if we talk about digital twins in general, it will be a similar development. Yeah, so would you that, get in the car? That I would get in the car. You would trust yeah, it, yeah? yeah. And, uh, just like we, we trust today cruise control. Yeah. And perhaps if you would have asked people, I don't know, 20 years ago, do you trust cruise control? They would say no. I read a book about NASA that they, in early 2000s, they, they claim to have created the first digital twin. But your point is, is that actually they've been around for a long time. I mean, when they were trying to do the physical world to a digital world. Yeah. Yes, as I think if you think of an airplane wing or something yeah. like that, making a digital model is of course something that has been around already for a very long time. I think the type of digital twins that we talked about today are dynamic, they are not static objects, and that yeah. makes of course life much more difficult. Yeah. What do you think of the future of digital twins? Could we actually do a digital twin of the Jenga stack? Yeah, but I'm much better in my simulations <laughs> than I'm in the real world. <laughs> if you think of uh, simulations and problem solving, I mean, I see a big leap of that. I don't know if you all see, see this, but I see it in my own world of we're using twins to simulate, you know, what if scenarios. Um, think about what if scenarios about if the vessel is going to be delayed, if the customer booking is impacted, if the terminal is going to be delayed. And one of the big things is in our industry, and I think COVID highlighted that was. If you, do you remember reading in the paper about how many vessels were anchored outside the LA? It's like at one point there was 100 vessels anchored out there because they were waiting to this capacity. And so we've been running twins and simulations to problem solve how we can take waste out. Uh, <laughs> this, yeah. So Gavin, I'm not a fan of the metaverse. Are you a fan of the metaverse? I, I could, do you need a second life? <laughs> do I need a second life? <laughs> Sometimes twins, it's people looking at things. You know, all concentrated in one yeah. location. You know, do we have con digital control towers and things like that? I think the metaverse can bring people together where physically you don't need to be together. I think you need things like metaverse to, to create engagement from people, right? That, 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 that people uh, that normally would not be engaged become engaged, but that assumes. <laughs> Process mining. Well, I mean, how does that link into, how does that enable yeah. successful? Yeah, so, so I'm, a, of course, a big fan of process mining, right? Uh, having an in, invented it at the end of the 90s, 
But I think it's crucial uh, that we have digital twins that are able to describe also processes and behavior. So, uh, so process mining is a technology that you can, from data, automatically construct process models that mimic the real process. And I think that's a very powerful technology. And I think specifically in recent years where we go to object-centric process mining, where we do not track one object, but where we are tracking, uh, let's say, different types of objects and how they interact with each other, uh, that is a technology that really helps to build uh, more realistic digital twins, also of dynamic uh, things. And, you, and you, how can you, can you see that as a potential if you think of end-to-end -end supply chains, where there is a number of events and objects uh, across that actually where process mining can really... Yes, so, so I think if you look, look at supply chains, also the supply chains that Maersk is supporting, I think you want to track certain things from, let's say, from the start to the end. And, and uh, uh, then that involves multiple modalities, etc. And I think process mining is a great technology to create transparency over multiple, uh, let's say, actors that, that, that are in, involved in that. And it gives a much better end-to-end -end view than you normally see. Of course, the big difficulty of, of uh, supply chains is that there are many different actors. And I think often it's not so much a matter of technology to be able to do it, but it's more of are willing people to share the data that you need to, uh, to, to do these types of things. Um, okay, Gavin, the, the next question is about uh, supply chains and sustainability. How do these two relate to each other and what does it have to do with digital twins? I mean, from our customers are asking us for visibility. They want to know what their carbon footprint is. They want to know about reduction. And I think a digital twin can give their insight across the whole end to end. But are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. No, and to the point where the industry, I think, can collaborate even more to kind of how we share data and insights. And some of the things that we're doing in terms of how we can what if scenarios about in terms of what it happens on a footprint or an emission. Um, you know, we're building platforms and looking at technologies and how we can do that. But actually, it's all predicated on the data. I'm in the board of governors of a company that supplies, uh, let's say, CO2 emission data. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very am amazing what kind of open data sets there are already. So if you have a hotel night in Aachen or, or you fly from here to, to Brisbane or whatever, you can see exactly the CO2 emissions. As I think some things are already possible and, and it's also relatively easy to combine that with process mining. Eh? You, you make a decision and you can kind of compute uh, the impact. Um, but to what degree companies are already willing to really invest in this and, and to really uh, use that, I think that happens to a limited degree. Just waiting for him to finish cheating. <laughs> <laughs> I think digital twins can often be used in an explorative way, right? that you can think about different scenarios knowing that everything is not uh, super accurate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and data, uh, I mean, that is the thread. I mean, this data quality and then to your like process mining. Then you have standardization, then you can visualize it, then you can systemize it. Many systems were not built uh, thinking that they would ever use the data in, in, in a particular way. Yes, as I still recall that uh, when we were, for example, doing process mining on medical devices, uh, depending on the language setting of the medical device, the logging would be different, right. which makes it very difficult to build a digital twin, of course. Uh, yeah, so, so, so I think that uh, companies need to, uh, to really invest in data quality to make these things uh, uh, possible. <laughs> this is a great question. Well, does the machine always know better? I think that is definitely not the case. Uh, yeah, so I like to talk about hybrid intelligence. Yeah? That, 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 that's the thing that really, really resonates with me uh, and with the things that I do. I think that there are certain things where humans are good at. I think there are certain things that machines are good at. So if you look at uh, machine learning, uh, it is relatively cheap, it is consistent, uh, uh, it is sort of reproducible, yeah? so, so it has many advantages. Uh, but at the same time, it can only deal with situations where there was already a lot of data that was very similar. 
right? You're smiling now. That's, yeah, uh, I uh, am. Because uh, I think I've just taken out the killer block. If you look at, uh, at for example, the, the things that happened with COVID, right? And how that changed everything. Uh, uh, this is clearly a situation where machine learning would not make any sense, right? Because there is a, you may have data, but the data that you have is completely useless. I think also the Ukraine war is impacting NIRSC in many different dimensions. And the power of machine learning is always, okay, to see patterns in things that have happened many times before. And I think the, uh, the basic idea of hybrid intelligence is that you take the best of machines and the best of humans. So humans are very creative, can come up with creative solutions, have intuition. And intuition is basically that you are able to make decisions when you have no data. You, you just need to trust your, your gut your feeling. instinct, yeah. yeah. Uh, and machines are very poor at that. So I definitely don't think that machines will always do the job. If you think of the open AI. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> One all. I mean, recently there's been the next generation of artificial intelligence, which can actually have emotion and context, I mean, do you see that? I, I don't see that, huh? like, but it's probably because I know the algorithms that are behind it. <laughs> okay. uh, if you look at uh, GPT-3, yes, where you exactly, just, yeah. you, you type one sentence and it generates something. But for instance, uh, uh, type the sentence, uh, explain me what process mining is or something like that and, and then it returns an answer and then you probably see an answer that that i don't know i wrote at some point in time <laughs> where the words are shuffled a bit around really? so, so is that intelligent i don't think so i think it's just uh, it creates the impression of being intelligent but at the end it is just the technology that given a certain input is trained to produce a certain output based on many examples you know, when you talk about cars and manufacturing, I mean, there was the concept of the lights out factory. But now I see factories actually kicking out the robots and bringing the humans back. Yeah. You know, there's a reversal because of what you said, you know, with X, you know, humans are good at exception. You know, we can standardize as much as we can, but yeah. when there's variation, sometimes today, machine learning can't handle exceptional variation. Yeah. So uh, the next question is, uh, what do you think of the evil twin? Oh, I'm not allowed to touch it, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to do this really slowly. Digital twins are all predicated just pure learned data. And if the data's right, that's the one version of the truth. The question is, do we accept, can we accept the truth? Well, yeah, that's of course, if you do process mining, that is what you encounter every, every time you apply it, right? Uh, uh, if, if your processes are great, uh, you don't need to do process mining. In the Netherlands, I led an initiative that was called Responsible Data Science, which was trying to tackle these types of things. And there we looked at four aspects. Fairness, are the outcomes fair? Uh, the, the second thing was, uh, is it accurate? Yeah, so algorithms always give a, an answer, even if they have no clue, right? Uh, Confidentiality, yeah? are you leaking certain information that is there? And the, and the third one is transparency. Yeah? If, an, if an electronic judge says that you have to go to jail, do you accept it if he cannot give a reason? And I think these are the, the four typical challenges that I think that you have if you're using data in an automated way that you need to ensure. There is a company that uh, will find a lot of money because they put into their algorithms when they were screening CVs, that it got a bias towards male candidates oh. because they didn't look how they created their oh. algorithm. So, and something that we're in in Maersk, you know, data ethics as part of our ESG agenda and how we are looking at data ethics and how you build it in at the beginning, not at the end when it's too yeah. late. Yeah. I think many times when people think about, uh, let's say, sophisticated things like machine learning, etc. They're always looking at one single problem that they would like to solve. And I think that's way too expensive. I think you need to uh, standardize your data completely and then have generic technologies that do whatever question pops up that you can give the answer.
Oh. <laughs> really? Where did you get that from? <laughs> the, the, this one, it, it, because, because the way it changes, it, uh, it, it now didn't have any. Okay, the, the spectacle. Oh! oh! <laughs> Britain won. <laughs> For a change. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Will. Thank you very much.